Hey, this is John. Let's Talk Native is now on Patreon. You can support the show by going to patreon.com slash let's talk native. We will be producing exclusive content for our Patreon supporters. Thanks for checking us out. Let's Talk Native is produced at the LTN Studios on the Cataraugus territory of the Seneca Nation. We break all the rules for Native media by peeling back the layers of assimilation and indoctrination. No prayers, no buffalo speeches, and no spirituality shows. While this podcast does not provide a path to spiritual enlightenment, we do take a tough look at history, oppression, and our survival. We highlight the voices of Native activists, writers, poets, artists, thinkers, and musicians who are fighting for the rights of Indigenous people all over Turtle Island. We may step on a few toes through our examination of culture, art, politics, history, and identity. But the real goal here is to bring our people together by breaking down what separates us. In this moment of historical change and social justice, our voices matter now more than ever before. So, welcome to Let's Talk Native with John Kane. Say so everyone, welcome to the show. I am John Kane, and this is Let's Talk Native. Um, I might want to do a couple of things here today. I, I want to give an update. Look, our last program covering... 1492 Land Back Lane. That is a really, really, really volatile situation. So I want to kind of give an update on that. I don't have really, you know, solid updates on what's happened in Mi'kmaq territory over the 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 lobster fishermen that uh, have been the victims of white supremacy and um, you know and arson and vandalism and you know physical violence, all that stuff. I do know that that, that conti that's continuing, and there is some effort to lay charges against some of these white supremacists, but they are really, really in a tough situation, uh, and hopefully in the next couple of shows, I'll be able to get more of an update from, uh, from somebody up uh, in Mi'kmaq territory to talk, uh, talk about that. Um, I did talk to some friends who are involved. Uh, I didn't, look, I don't want to constantly try to drag Skyler um, onto the the program. He's got a lot of stuff going on. He's he's a bit overwhelmed, and and frankly, Skyler Williams tried to be very clear that he is not trying to represent himself as a leader of the resistance there. That he has been asked to be a spokesperson, and frankly, I think he's doing a hell of a job. Um, if you want to revisit that that show as a podcast or you know as as our video, it it, it was a show number uh, four seventy three, and it was you know, again we we did that on on Monday night. Is that right, Monday night? Yeah, yeah, we did it on Monday night because. Um, uh, no, I'm sorry. It was, we did it on Friday. We normally, we, we do a, a, a Saturday show and I was concerned because things are, are getting so, um, uh, again, so volatile. I wanted to do a show immediately. So, so we, we, we did the show on, uh, a, on a Friday show. We did it early. Um, and I do encourage you to, to check it out. Uh, you know, again, my, my hats off and, and all my respect goes to, to Skylar Williams and all those folks who are involved in this. Um, Again, if you're following on social media, it can be somewhat deceiving because it depends on who's posting what. And, and there's a there's a lot of race there are a lot of racist tropes out there. Um, so I mean, it's it's really you know, I'm going to try to give you the most reliable information from the folks who are trying to resist the development and the encroachment onto um, uh, onto Six Nations territory. Uh, I got a, you know I was able to go through some maps and get a better understanding. Uh, on the lay of the land, I, I've been to Six Nations, you know, many times, but not enough to really know um, where all, you know, know the, the, the again the, the the geography of of these areas, and, and so trying to familiar familiarize myself with that. Um, look, we did show 
And and as per that our last program, there was some. We did have a conversation about the road being tore up, but I got to tell you, the way it stands right now, um, the barricades that were erected on both um, Argyle Street, which is really the the road that Douglas Estates is being built off of, um, and uh, and then farther below some of the the residences of of. Uh, Caledonia, what is considered Land Back Lane, out to what is uh, what is Mackenzie Road, um, they've they did more than just tear up the road. Uh, by some estimates, the they dug a ditch t- uh, as much as ten or twenty feet deep along Mackenzie Road. Now, just to understand, our what what the people of Six Nations have done is saying, look, you're not going to you know expand that that city that village of caledonia onto our territories and so these um barricades are basically stopping the traffic that comes south of the um, of the city of caledonia um on either argyle street or on the um uh, on this mackenzie road so it is it is a it's more than just a human barricade this is now a physical barricade um, that is bolstered by by having the road tore up. Now, th- a lot of this stuff has been done since the attack, um, where the OPP was open fire with rubber bullets or, or whatever. Um, and <laughs> here's the other irony: is that this was done with the equipment that uh, that is was left to be to build these uh, these expanded you know villages, these expanded homes. So. Um, our, our guys commandeered some of the the heavy equipment that was was left there. So it's it's kind of a, a sweet irony, I guess, that that they left the equipment that allowed us to to tear up the roads. Um, you know, and this is a you know a strategy that that we've talked about even as it relates to other uh, situations where where native people have tried to stand up against um, uh, whether whether they're blocking our highway or, or whatever else. In this, even even for us here in Seneca territory, back in the day when we were resisting um, the state police from trying to stop our commerce and that kind of thing, we would we would try to be a moving target for them. And and, and while these roads are are tore up in very specific places, now that it, that it, there's almost a more permanent sense of of a barricade there, we don't have to have the same five five ten fifteen guys. Um, you know, always there. Uh, you know, frankly, some of these barricades can be left <laughs> because nobody's going to be driving through there. And you know, so our, we can we can uh, go to these things and be at these things at our convenience. We can go home and eat dinner. We can sleep in a warm bed. So while all these you know provincial police and and whoever else gets involved, you know, come there and have to put their lo- their long hours in as pawns of the uh, uh, you know of these developers, then. Um, you know, look, let let their lives be uh, disrupted, and and I think that's that's really what's what's playing out here. Um, I think our the the native community is becoming even more more unified, and that's not a, a term that I that I use lightly because you know I've, in fact I got into a debate with somebody on social media about this idea of unity because in our way when we we don't talk about unity as much as we talk about bringing our minds together and and bring our minds together as one so while some people think about unity they think about you know people coming out in mass and standing arm in arm and you know our our bodies you know coming together in our culture we talk about our minds coming together and sometimes it is really difficult because between elected councils band councils and and church and 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 assimilation and and you know uh even the longhouse the division between you know, the code of handsome lake followers and the great law followers there's a lot of places where our minds are not together so sometimes it's really really difficult to bring our bodies together if our minds are are, are separated by all these disparate beliefs <clears throat> so I, I, unity is is a it, it's it's, it sounds sounds like this this great you know panacea for uh, you know for bringing our people together, but the idea of being unified really requires that we bring our minds together, and and oftentimes our minds aren't together. So 
I think we can bring our minds together on specific subjects. And, and that's when we talk about counseling and we talk about, you know, even the, the process of the Guyana Lagoa. It's about concentrating on an issue and bringing our minds together on that one issue. And that has kind of happened here. Uh, both the, the band council and the, and the chief's councils have issued statements supporting this resistance of this expansion onto, you know, uh, these, these expanded developments. And, and, and that's a good thing, but it isn't everything. And, and I say that because as I've mentioned before on this show, uh, the, the general consensus is, is that only about 4% of the population of six nations of Oswego vote in band council elections. I mean, in, in fact, it's, it's absurd to suggest that band councils are in any way, shape or form the legitimate government of, uh, you know, of six nations, Grand River, Oswego, whatever you want to call it. And in fact, one of their elected chiefs actually went on record, and this has been quoted many times in, in a couple of videos and, and a couple of other uh, books that have been written, uh, Bill Montour basically said they don't, he didn't view himself as a, as a chief of, of Grand River. He viewed himself as an administrator and, and he accurately kind of explained that be, they don't have the consent of the people and, and their job is to administer Canadian programs, you know, you know, Canadian funds, not to govern over and, and to rule over the people of six nations. And, and that was one of the guys who, who was elected by 4% of the, <laughs> you know, that participate in these, these elections. So it's, uh, and, and so I give him, you know, kudos for, for being not self-deprecating, but just being honest about it. And, and unfortunately, even on the so-called traditional council side, these, these guys who claim to be condoled chiefs and, and, and are not just claimed. I mean, some of them are condoled chiefs and, 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 you know, the, the leadership within these long, these long houses, they fall short of, of operating under Guyana or Goa as well. So you have two essentially governing systems, um, neither one of them are very accurate and, and frankly, neither one of them fully operate, uh, consistent with, with, with our culture. So while it's great to have the chiefs council and the band council, um, offer their statements here, the real issue is the people. And, and, and you know, for those who don't know, uh, Six Nations, Grand River, uh, Oswego, is essentially the largest and most populated single um, native community uh, on the Canadian side. Uh, yeah, I know most people don't, don't, don't know that. And, and we don't think about how populated or how vast n these native territories are. Uh, it's not the biggest geographically, perhaps. Um, but as far as being called a reservation, it might be. I don't know. But, uh, but it's the most populated. And, and, and again, it's a unique situation because it's not the Mohawks. It's not the Onondagas. It's not the Cayugas. It's, it's Six Nations. It's, it's all, it really has this the sense of... Uh, of a community of, of people who identify, self-identify as Haudenosaunee. And although what that really means in terms of governance, in terms of, I mean, really understanding culture, that, that varies too. There are some people who, you know, frankly are, are great language keepers. They understand, they don't know stories. They know so much. There's so much of that. And yet, because the, the community is so diverse and, uh, it, it's hard to it's hard to understand or wrap your head around a specific governing system for the, for the whole community for all the people, um, and maybe it's not even necessary because when the people speak, they should be the leaders. It's the people sh who should be leading the government, not the uh, governments, uh, not the other way around. And in this situation, that's kind of what's playing out. You know, there were uh, uh, enough people who wanted to take a stand against this expansion of these, uh, you know, these home builds, these residences, these luxury uh, homes being built and expand and the expansion of the, of the city of Caledonia onto native territory, onto, dis dis onto disputed lands. And in fact, you know, uh, one of the things that was, um, uh, was verified was that the mayor of Caledonia is actually one of the purchasers of one of these homes to be built out of this Douglas Estates or, or one of these expanded residential builds that's happening. You know, so the conflict of interest couldn't be more clear. And whether it's for him or his kids or whatever else, but he's one of the purchasers. 
So, and, and he's and he's also quoted with you know with one of these these ridiculous quotes that comes from a white person. When a white person says, "Oh, the uh, these people of Six Nations have to realize you just can't take other people's property." It's like, really, <laughs> really? Uh, get, will you put that in writing? Because isn't that how you guys came to be on our territories in the first place? I mean, it, the hypocrisy is you know is so thick and and so apparent, and it it fits in. Again, with the with the bigger conversation about white supremacy, about this idea that that white people just feel so entitled. I mean, I, I heard uh, you know somebody was quoted. You know, one of these uh, these these white guys was quoted as uh, saying it was a good time to start burning longhouses. You know, and, and it just gives you an idea that while they try to cast us as the terrorists, as the as uh, as the violent ones, I'll give you another example. There's a short video that the OPP was actually putting out that shows a, a couple of young guys coming out and, um, uh, and trying to you know, get these OPP to, to pull out, leave with their car. They hit on the, the car a few times and they you know, hit a window or two and they, you know, the one guy had a lacrosse stick. In fact, one, one of the guys threw a rock and smashed the window in the, the front of the, the cruiser. And they're saying, look at how violent these bar people are. But what they don't tell you is this is right after they shot rubber bullets at, you know, at, at our people. And, and, and I think Skyler did a great job saying, look, when they come out with a gun and they, and they pull a trigger, we don't know that it's not a shotgun, you know, shooting a, a slug. You know, we, we find out later or, or and, and even when you get hit by one of these things, I mean, they are painful and you don't know what just happened. All you know is you've been shot. So they can say, well, yeah, we opened fire, but they were, they were non-lethal uh, rounds. But you know what? We've seen over and over again on the U.S. and the Canadian side that when used inappropriately, these so-called non-lethal weapons can be lethal and they can, they can inflict permanent and not only is you shoot something in the face. I know people have lost eyes and, and have had, you know, permanent damage done to them by these non-lethal weapons and, and, and you could kill somebody with them. So, but that's why these guys were pissed. And one of the things that, that as I watched the video, I said, look, if these cops are all that, and if they're so righteous, why didn't they just arrest these guys? Because they didn't. They just sat in there videotaping. And you know, let the dash cam, you know, catch, catch what was going on. They didn't get out. In fact, from what I understand, one of these guys might have been one of the people they had a warrant for. But these gutless cops who only served to antagonize the situation, not only opened fire with tasers and with, with rubber bullets and, and that kind of thing, but their presence there. And that's what they're being told. They're saying, get out of here. You, you have no reason to be here. Now, the, the injunction that, that Skylar talked about in the last program, that still exists. And, and it's a, it is a permanent injunction. Uh, associated with these injunctions, are, they have a list of warrants that they're, that they're in fact, you know, they've, they've served them at, you know, at Walmart parking lots. They, they, any, any way they could pick people up. And, and, you know, and there have been people who have been picked up at border crossings, any place that, uh, that they see as an opportunity to, to, uh, to arrest, or to, to take into custody one of these people, they've done it. So they're rarely doing it there on site because they, I don't know, they, they, whether it's their own fear or their own safety or their acknowledgement that, that it's inappropriate. But this is, you know, a, a, a kind of further uh, points out the, the, the disproportionate way or the, the asymmetric way that justice is doled out in a situation like this. Now, I do understand there is a conversation at this point about possibly lifting, although it's, it's crazy because, you know, you, you think about imposing or lifting a temporary restraining order. This is right now is a permanent uh, injunction. And there's talk about vacating that. Uh, and there has been an effort to try to bring other people to a negotiating table. But all while this is going on, you still have an OPP, an Ontario Provincial Police presence in, this, in these areas, and they have antagonized the situation. Now, to, give a, you know, to further explain what, what's happening on our side of this issue, not only have the roads been tore up, but permanent structures, as, as Skyler mentioned on the program, they're 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 putting in more building, um, uh, more more permanent buildings at these uh, these locations where they've barricaded the road. Um, they're trying to make them more accommodating in terms of you know uh, insulated, something that's going to withstand the winter. Our guys are in this thing for the long haul, and 
every time there's been a conversation that's either come from the police or from, or, you know, or from the legal system says, well, what can we do to get you guys to leave? They're saying nothing. You, you, we're not going to leave. And, and well, what, what's it going to take? Whatever it is going to take, you're not, you're not here to offer it. So our people are, are, are there and, um, and they, they plan to be there permanently. Now, I, I also want to mention, it isn't just the roads that they've tore up. They have, they've actually dismantled the, the, the rail systems that go through there. So it's not just, you know, it isn't just, you know, digging up some, uh, you know, some asphalt. These are, are, are pretty big barricades that have been dug. And the, 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 uh, the tracks and the highways, neither one of them are passable. So it's not just somebody didn't just drag a van up on the tracks. It's more than that. And they haven't just, you know, put up some, you know, drop a tree over a road. This is more permanent than that. So I think it's important that people realize that our people are serious about stopping this sprawl, uh, this suburban sprawl into, uh, into what is clearly, clearly disputed land. And, and whether you know a judge issues a a, a, a a permanent injunction telling native people you can't go there, we're not going to be honoring it. And you know I, I posted because what this judge um, and one of the articles suggested that um, individuals like Skyler could be held in contempt of court. Look, they clearly you know have contempt for this court, even as they've given enough respect to participate or attempt to participate. They, and, and all of us, we, we all hold contempt for these courts. And, and, and I'll tell you, on, on this side, on the U.S. side, that goes from the local courts that try to uh, assert jurisdiction over our territories all the way up to the Supreme Court. And, you know, even the, the left side of that Supreme Court, which is a whole other subject we'll, we'll talk about on another show. But um, these courts don't respect us. And so the idea that we're supposed to give them respect, and, and as, as Skyler had laid out, they tried to answer in the, in the order to show cause why a, an injunction shouldn't be issued. And the judge says, no, we're not gonna, well, I'm not even going to take, uh, take their submissions. Why? Because they're not honoring the temporary restraining order we put in place. And so if they're standing in my, if they're submitting documents and they are in contempt of court, I don't have to accept. So... So this wasn't even this was in, nothing even close to a um, uh, a fair hearing of any kind. So, but because our people are standing strong, statements have come from the band council. Statements have come from the chiefs, um, uh, and and the people are, are being, being very clear that they are not going to leave. They are not giving up this fight. It doesn't matter if the mayor of Caledonia has you know put money down you know for for a new home. Well, there's plenty of homes in Caledonia. <laughs> you don't need to be building on, on this disputed land. And, and again, to, to, to revisit, when the Six Nations were, uh, were, were relocating to this area, the British crown offered a mile on either side of the, um, uh, the, the Grand River. You know, from and it was supposed to be from, from you know, uh, from its source to where it it, it uh, pours into into the lake, and so much of that land has been swindled away. I mean, we're talking about this is a significant piece of land. I mean, if you if you look on a map and you follow the Grand River from you know the lake, to, if you even even determine on a map where its source is, it's a it's a huge area. I mean, and so this track was supposed to be honored. And it and it hasn't been. Grand River, the 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 native territory, the community, Six Nations, Grand River, Oswego, it is a postage stamp compared to uh, to the overall uh, lay of this this land that was supposed to be secured for the people of Six Nations. And many times, when we've gone through these kinds of negotiations on either side of that imaginary line, we have always tried to secure land that had a river going through it. Because, you know, again, water is life. It might be a catchy phrase now, but it's always been Yogonoru. We know that it's precious. So it's always been a big part of who we are. So we can follow um, many, many uh, um, treaties, if you will, where we 
put a, a solid emphasis on the lands being along uh, along a river. Look, I'm talking to you from from Cattaraugus. Um, this whole territory, the Cattaraugus territory of the Seneca Nation, l lies along the the Cattaraugus Creek. Uh, Allegheny, it runs, uh, it, 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 um, that runs along the Allegheny River. It, going back to Oneida and, and so many other places, you can follow every one of our territories are along, are, are, are along a river. That's because it's what we, it's the last vestige of what we were able to hold on to. And even then it was whittled away. That's what's at stake here with this whole idea of, of expanding onto the, uh, of, of the city of Caledonia, expanding onto the, the lands of, uh, of, the, of the Six Nations, of, of the people of the Six Nations. So I think it's important that people understand that. And maybe we'll even get some, some graphics uh, uh, together uh, on this show or for, or for um, a later show to kind of put it in, into its proper perspective. But um, uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the, those who were willing to give me an update on, um, on what's actually happening there. The, the permanent... Um, the, the permanent nest of the the barricades that have been now not just built but dug up and uh, uh, out of these streets. I think it's important that people realize that our people aren't going anywhere, and we're going to continue to resist this. And at some point, it doesn't matter if they issue you know warrants. It doesn't matter if they issue you know injunctions, uh, you know restraining orders, whatever. Canada's going to have to yield. Because our people aren't, aren't, aren't backing down. And, and look, I've heard the comments from the mayor. I've heard the comments from, from Ford, uh, uh, from the, uh, the minister of Ontario. Uh, ha I haven't heard a whole lot that's come out of, uh, out of Ottawa. You know, Trudeau seems to be somewhat uh, you know, mute on this issue. So we're, we'll, we'll see how that, some of that plays out. But again, as I said on the last program, You've got this conflict going on. You've got the Mi'kmaq conflict going on. You still got Wet'suwet'en conflict going on. These, it's like it's like Canada. Um, they're they're as ignorant to the um, the optics, I guess, of of their aggression towards Native people as as the as the U S the cops on the U S side are when it comes to the continuing um, aggression against you know against people of color. Last night, perfect example. Uh, a cop shoot down a, a young man who had a uh, who had a knife in his hand, and they could have tased him. They could have done any number of things, but they shot him ten times, killed him uh, in, right in front of his family while his family was pleading with them not to not to to shoot him. And so now the city of Philadelphia is uh, all in turmoil, uh, burning cop cars and, and and all that stuff. It it is it's just classic. Uh, you know, people responding to, you know, to this lack of justice. So, uh, um, but again, U.S. Canadian sides, I mean, the, the racism, the white supremacy is so evident and so apparent and it plays in to the systems. That's all when we talk about systemic racism, this is what we're talking about. The courts that can't recognize, the cops that can't recognize, the politicians can't recognize that we predate their existence. Everything that they claim to hold, hold near and dear to their hearts, they, they either got from us through fraud, deception, uh, aggression. And at some point we say, no, we say no more. We, we push back. That's what, that, that's what we're seeing plays out. All right. Hey, we're going to take a break here and we'll come back. I do want to do, a, I'm going to do a few COVID numbers. I haven't done many of those uh, lately. And, and there's some clear, you know, records being set here. And, you know, there's some milestones in, um, in the success of, of, of the, this, this pandemic to, um, to inflict harm on, on humanity. So we'll, we'll talk about that when we come back. This is John Kane. This is Let's Talk Native. So, thanks for coming back. This is John Kane, and this is Let's Talk Native. Uh, let me continue. As I said before the break, um, let me run through some COVID numbers. Um, the U.S. unofficially uh, hits 9 million people um, confirmed by test uh, positive uh, with COVID-19 
cases. That's 9 million people. Uh, they also unofficially uh, reach uh, 232,000 deaths. Now, look, 9 million people sounds like a lot of people. But I have to remind people that you're talking about a population of 330, um, you know, uh, 331 million people. So l most people understand that this 9 million confirmed by test is probably only about 10% of the, uh, the, the real number of, of people who've been infected. But even if it's 90 million, even if 90 million people have been infected, you still, you still have 240 million people who are available for COVID-19 to take lodging in their lungs. I mean, if it's 9 million, there's 322 million people. If it's 90 million, it's, it's 240. So there's a lot of people yet to be sick. And, and all the boasting about all the testing that has been done, I have to remind people again, if you tested negative today, tomorrow, you still could get infected. So, and, you know, and again, when I see those numbers, oh, we've tested more people than anybody else in the, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know what? That's, here's another thing about the testing. Many people, and I don't know what the number really is, but many people have been tested multiple times. So when you see some big number on the number of tests that were given, understand that's not how many people have been tested because some people have been tested two, three, four, five. I'm look, if you're an athlete, apparently you get tested all the time. And apparently if you work in government, you're getting tested all the time. So that's not the number of people tested. That's how many tests have been given. Some people have been tested so many times that you know, even my wife has been tested twice. I've never been tested. Just talking to my, to my, my buddy, Matt, who, who's getting his, just got his second test done. You know, he's waiting for the, for the feedback because somebody in his work environment tested positive. So there are, for all the tests that have been given, some of them are the same people being tested many, you know, several times over. So look, so what does this mean? Nine million people. Well, that's a pretty big number. And last Friday and Saturday, um, that over 80,000 people tested positive in a, in a single day. Were, were confirmed positive by test on, on both Saturday. And, and, you know, Sunday is usually when that number drops way down, not because there's less people getting sick, but just because of reporting information. Sunday and Monday, those numbers really dropped down. But I'll tell you, this past Sunday and this uh, – and, and, uh, and, and Monday, they those numbers didn't drop down as low as previous Sundays or previous Mondays. So there's a good chance that by this Friday, that number, Friday and Saturday, that number may be 90,000 um, per day, uh, a, a, a daily, daily case rate. And by the Friday after next week's election, it, there's a really good chance that the United States will finally hit six figures on, on a given day. Uh, for people being tested. Six, six figures meaning over 100,000, in case people don't know what six figures mean. But that's how bad this is getting. Now, these are the highest numbers that the United States have seen since the beginning of this whole thing. This isn't like a, you know, a blip on the radar screen. This is the highest number. When you're talking about 80,000 people in a single, in a single day, or 90 or, or 100, whatever it's going to be by the time next week rolls around, that's how many people are being affected. Now, Granted, there is seem, does seem to be better testing or, or, or thera therapy for these things. So the death rate is dropping down because it's it's a different level of, of you know people who are being tested are not just the people who are on their deathbed. So the uh, the mortality rate is lower. But I got to tell you, now that we're seeing this spike in another you know eight or ten days, you're going to see a real big spike in in the uh, in the the number of deaths per day. And, you know, and that's coming just in time for the, you know, for the big commercial holiday seasons uh, that, you know, with Christmas and Thanksgiving and all that stuff. It's, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be amazing. I mean, to, to see the, dis, the, the difference that as this year closes out, you've got this crazy election that's happening and, and all of the, the chaos associated with that. You've got, you know, you know, protests in the street, call them riots if you want to. Um, but you've got, you know, conflict with, with police. You've got conflict with, uh, with 
you know, white supremacy groups. You've got a white supremacist uh, incumbent president who may or may not get uh, reelected, you know, come next week. And whether he acknowledges uh, you know, a defeat or not will be, will be a whole nother challenge. And this is all happening in the midst of a pandemic. I mean, the crazy part is there's never been a better time to change systems as far as how elections take place. And, and that's been, been resisted by the right big time in terms of, you know, um, uh, uh, mail-in votes or absentee votes or, you know, uh, without having to go stand in a, in a line of people, uh, which uh, them by themselves could be super spreader events. You've got one candidate that's still uh, addressing crowds with, uh, uh, you know, without masks on and that kind of stuff uh, who's you know and, and and Donald Trump who's who spread the virus I mean Herman Cain died as a result of catching the coronavirus at a, at a Tulsa riot months ago he they've had the White House has been inundated rally. huh he said riot. oh rally riot same thing yeah <laughs> Tulsa not Tulsa riot that's a whole nother issue Tulsa rally I'm sorry those words just seem to go together because of history if you know history but I mean, even the vice president of the United States, his staff is all infected and he's still going out, possibly contaminating people. Because if you come into contact with somebody who tests positive, you're supposed to self-quarantine for 14 days. No, not the vice president. No, not not the albino uh, second in command. He's going to go out there and, sh you know, shake hands and, and do his campaigning because getting reelected is more important than saving anybody's life. And that's that's the bottom line for somebody like Donald Trump or, or Mike Pence. So it is crazy. But this this coronavirus thing is is just it's it's not going away. And, and, and in spite of whatever Trump says about turning the corner, there's no corner being turned. And in fact, what we're going to experience in the next three months may make everything that's happened over this past you know nine months pale by comparison. And it's just it's, it's just a a lesson in incompetence at the state levels at the federal level uh, and by by mankind look when i think about you know the the attitude that so many americans have that they just don't want to be dictated to they don't want to be told to wear a mask <clears throat> they don't want to be told anything you know they, they view the idea that that a government state local you know federal telling you to wear a mask is somehow an infringement on their their rights it's it's absurd it's it's absurd and and this is where we're we're going to see this thing play out because there is not a comprehensive way to uh, to combat the coronavirus Look, even even in new york state and this the governor of new york state wants to brag about how much he control he's taking look nobody's even come close to catching the amount of death that uh, that New York State uh, incurred, and New York State's numbers are going up too. I expect within the month that whatever schools are currently um, taking students, you know, and having you know live classrooms, will uh, will not have them. They'll go. They'll go all go virtual. Or I mean, and look, this is incredibly disruptive. I not only do have. have you know, adults been using schools for daycare for, you know, for decades. But you look, you know, the all of the, the co-curricular activities, you know, have, have changed. I mean, sports have been been abandoned as associated with school. I think kids have become so disillusioned with the, this idea of school because some of the very things that would have been part of their school experience is completely being wiped out. I don't know what the long-term effects are going to be. Obviously, this is going to have impact on on secondary education as well. So we're going to see how this how, how this plays out. But let me tell you, it does not look good from here, and there is nothing to su suggest anything but um, but a, a more grave outcome um, playing out over the next uh, next several months. Look, flu season is when you would expect this thing to happen, but this thing has been been. You know, carried all the way through, you know, spring, summer, fall, and now as we we head into into winter, uh, this is when people become uh, more confined, more you know, diseases e more easily spread. I mean, the, again, the, the logic that comes out of these politicians, some of them, especially on the right, suggesting, well, oh, see, they got it all wrong. They said these were all being, um, you know, big 
large groups uh, gathering that spread the disease. Now they're saying it's small groups. No, it's because it's changing, you morons. Now, as people become more uh, uh, um, <laughs> domesticated, I guess, more in their homes, right? Then this is where you're going to have pockets of, uh, of, of not so necessarily big super spreader events, but sm small uh, spreader events. And they're going to go from household to household, especially if people get together for their Thanksgiving dinners and their Christmas dinners and their, and their holiday parties and all, uh, all that stuff. It's just going to get worse and worse. Uh, so anyway, that's that's my my, my COVID minute. I do want to spend a, a little bit of time, although I'm, I'm going to address this in, in another show uh, as we <laughs> as this election thing starts to unfold. You know, one of the things that 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 I get into a debate with over people, and I get accused of being a bully because look, I don't support voting. I mean, native people voting. I I really don't support voting if you're native and you live on native territory voting, and. The debate that I have, and I'm not going to necessarily talk about voting here, but, but the debate that I have is, is this idea that we are not confined by living with, the, with how the federal government or the state government, Canadian or U.S. government, wants to define us. If they say we're their citizens, doesn't mean that we have to agree with that. And when I hear people say, well, like it or not, we're, we're all U.S. citizens. No, we aren't. Or like it or not, we're under the jurisdiction. Well, that's not true either. That's what their claim is. And in fact, look, I have been a part of legal proceedings. I have you know, been involved in, in court cases. You know, and in fact, I've even testified as an expert witness in a few. We always take the position that the state and the federal government doesn't, don't have jurisdiction over us. So when I hear a native person who's trying to justify them, them voting or, or doing whatever, assimilating, saying, well, we don't really have a choice. Well, I'm sorry. That's just wrong. We get to decide who we are. In, in the United States, in 1924, when they passed the Indian Citizenship Act, that was white people that got together in Congress and declared that we were U.S. citizens. We don't have to accept that. They don't have the power to make that a, a reality. We have the power to make it a reality. If we, con if we concede to that, if we allow ourselves to be subjugated by their claims that we are theirs, that they now own us, they own our lands, they own our, our, you know, our, our nationality, it's only if we concede to that. And look, plenty of you out there are. But part of it is maybe you just don't understand that we have a choice, that we get to define who we are. We don't have to accept being called an Indian, a Native American or American Indian, a First Nation. We don't have to be, accept being called, frankly, we don't have to accept being called Mohawk or Seneca. We can be Gunyakahaga, Onundawaga. In fact, that's who we really are. All of these labels they put on us, I mean, they try to separate us. Oh, Seneca Nation of Indians, Tonawanda Band of Senecas, the Oneida Indian Nation of New York, the Oneida Band, a, a tribe of Wisconsin. No, we don't have to accept any of those labels. Even if they use them, if they use those labels, that's on them. And we can say, look, we don't accept that. But more importantly than telling them that, we don't have to accept that. We get to decide how we identify ourselves. We get to decide who we are. They don't. So when I hear, you know, and, and, and then when I, because I'm trying to tell Native people, you get to decide whether you're an American citizen or not, a U.S. citizen or not. And somebody says, well, you, you're just bullying people or you're shaming people. No, I'm not. In fact, when I hear somebody say, we don't have a choice, that sounds more aggressive and more bullying than, than me saying that we do have a choice. And this is the conversation that I have through a lot of social media and, you know, Twitter and Facebook and other places. I, I get into a constant, you know, discussion, argument, debate, I guess, with people who want to insist that whatever they did, whatever the U.S. did. I mean, when I hear people say that we're under, you know, state jurisdiction or U.S. jurisdiction, and I said, well, that's their position that you're agreeing with. That's not our position. In fact, we will argue every single day, you know, even if we don't fight it on every front, 
And, and, and so this idea that because we aren't fighting on every front that we somehow agree with it, that's not true. That's, again, another one of their, their legal doctrines. They call it acquiescence, the doctrine of acquiescence. If we don't fight on every turn, every time a cop car comes down through one of our roads, or every time, or if we don't, you know, strike every American flag that somebody wants to fly on our, uh, you know, on territory. <laughs> and don't get, don't get me started there because tribal councils and band councils, they're always flying the, the flags of our oppressors. You know, Canadian flags, U.S. flags. I mean, Seneca Nation, there are more American flags fly, flown here on Seneca Nation than, uh, than Seneca flags. I mean, and that's just, that's just an uncomfortable truth. But you know what? Just because they're there doesn't mean that, that we all have agreed to U.S. citizenship. And in fact, if you ask that question, if, and if you pose it the way it should be posed, are you a Seneca or are you a U.S. citizen? Here, people are going to say, I'm a, I'm a Seneca. But they don't know that there's a choice there. They, don't, they think, oh, oh, I'm both. Really? Okay, so you, then your citizenship is U.S., and you're just only of Seneca descent now? That's what they're trying to do to us. That's the way they're trying to frame us. And I think it's important that we say, no, we are not descendants of, uh, of a once proud people. We are those people. It's one of the problems that I have. And, and although I'll use the word indigenous, the one problem I have with that word is that it is defined differently depending on who's, who's using it, I guess. And even in, in the international realm, uh, at the UN and such, th when they talk about the, the word indigenous, they're oftentimes using it within the context of being the descendants of, um, of a sovereign people. You know, of, of the, we are the descendants of the people um, who lived here prior to colonization. And I say, no, we aren't the descendants of those people. I mean, we are those people. I mean, I'm not saying that they aren't that they aren't part of our ancestry, but to, to say that we're that they were merely descendants of those people suggests that we aren't those people. And look, and that's a debate we get all into all the time. Look, even in court proceedings, we oftentimes will hear somebody say, "Well, you know, we're no longer going to recognize you as the people we treated with." Really? The people you treated with were not the Oneida Indian Nation of New York or the Seneca Nation of Indians. Those are words that you would, that you imposed upon us afterwards. Those that's your labels. Even this idea of federal recognition, I've, I've had this conversation before. The federal government claims that they recognize, um, you know, whatever it is four hundred seventy-five, you know, federally recognized tribes. Most of that's bullshit, because it's not like four uh, the 475 native groups of people said would you please recognize me as a tribe band or nation of indians subordinate to your laws no almost none of them did and when i say almost none of them you can count probably on 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 one hand or two hands all those people who went to the federal government and said please i want you to grant me recognition as a subordinate to you and, and in fact, even many that have looked and pursued federal recognition don't understand that to be federally recognized means that you are subordinate to them. Now, if they say that, but we have never said that, then that's a different thing again. I mean, the, the Seneca nation, the Seneca people never asked to be recognized as a tribe, band, or nation of Indians subordinate to the laws of the United States. So if the federal government lists the Senecas, the Seneca Nation or the Tonawana Band of Senecas or, or whoever, if they list them as one of their federally recognized tribes, that doesn't mean that we've conceded to that. And this has to be something that we as individuals and every Native individual, I talked earlier about this idea of unity, about bringing our minds together. Well, the problem is we're all using different languages. And, and even when we're using English, we're all using different words. We're, we're calling ourselves Indians. We're calling ourselves tribes. We're calling our lands territories or reservations or, uh, you know, or nations. Mo all of those words aren't ours. Even the word nation, I sometimes have difficulty with. And the reason I have difficulty with it is because some people try to put a, a political connotation to that. I mean, I don't say that I'm a citizen of the Mohawk Nation or a citizen of the Gunyakahaga. Why? Because even the word citizen has a political connotation to it. Like we are a part that we, we, we 
uh, have al aligned ourselves with a, a specific government. Or, and that's not even the case. Like I said, look at Six Nations. Only 4% vote in their, their band council elections. And the chiefs, uh, the council that exists there, they would have a hard time really determining what level of support they have across the vast population there too. So it's governing, governance and decision-making. Look, it's, it's great to have uh, different ways of, of making a, uh, you know, reaching a decision. And, and look, I appreciate the fact that the band council and the chief's council are both supporting uh, 1492 land back lane and the resistance there, but it wasn't their call. And they're just, as, as the institutions that they are, and oftentimes institutions that are somewhat murky in terms of where that, that authority comes from, it's great that they've thrown their support, but they don't have, they don't have the authority to, to start or stop something like this. So, but we as people, we still have the power. We still possess the power, not because the Guyana Lagoa says, the, the Guyana Lagoa recognizes that. We have it because we're born with it. We are born with the right and the ability to carry ourselves. You know, frankly, America, U.S. and Canadian citizens, you're born with that right too. But you, be, you get indoctrinated at birth to conform to, to their governmental structures. The same thing is happening to Native people. But we have to become more enlightened. We have to become woke, as they say. You know, I oftentimes talk about my, my friends in Hawaii because after a couple of generations, pretty much, you know, put their heads down after the illegal occupation and annexation of Hawaii, this, this last couple of generations are saying, oh, hell no. We know what you did was fraud. We don't have a, a, as, as many native people, you know, through all of Turtle Island, Taking as, as solid a position as some of those some, some of those Ganaka Maoli in, uh, in in the Hawaiian Kingdom are taking, they're saying no, we we're not asked, we don't want to be recognized as a tribe. That's what Barack Obama was trying to do to the Hawaiians. No, we don't we don't want to be recognized as a tribe. We're fighting for our kingdom back. That's what they call their nation, the kingdom. But we don't have our own people doing that here. We have our people you know, feeling like they're, they've been beat down and that they don't have a choice in who and, and who and how they define themselves. So my message to all you people who think that I'm bullying you because I say you, you get to decide whether you're a U.S. citizen or a Canadian citizen. That's not, I'm not trying to beat anybody up for that. Now, if you take offense to the, to, to, to the notion that if you vote, you have made that decision and you have made that voluntary proclamation to be a U.S. citizen. If that offends you, well, you don't need to be offended by me because I'm saying it. It's your actions that create that. If you accept your, your existence as merely a part of the, the, the oppressiveness of colonization, that's a choice you're making. And, and if you make that choice, that doesn't make you my enemy, per se, although I still will look at the United States and Canada as an oppressive force. But I have friends who are U.S. citizens. I have friends who are Canadian citizens. I have family that claim so. But you know what? Don't, make, don't think that I have to accept that, even if uh, other people have. And if you feel shamed by me bringing this up, you can always change your position. If you voted in last election, if you voted in this, this election, it doesn't mean you have to stay with that. You can say, you know what? I realize that I've been duped. I realize that I do have a choice and I choose to be Ununduwaga. I choose to be Gunyagahaga. I choose to be Unyotaaga. I choose to be Unguyunwe. Why? Because that's my birthright. Anything else that has been imposed upon me through, through laws or statutes, you know, or the, the oppressiveness of the, of the systemic racism that exists in the United States. No, I don't have to concede to that. So, look, if you're offended by some of the things that I say about voting or about citizenship, you don't, you don't need to interpret my words as 
bullying you or, or shaming you. Just know that you have a choice. And, and, ex and at least accept it. Accept that, that if, you, if that's the choice that you've made, that it is a choice that you've made. Wherever you end up. All right. Well, uh, thanks for listening to the program. I will stay on top of both the Mi'kmaq situation and the um, and the, the the 1492 land back lane situation uh, as things unfold. And these are volatile situations, as are most of our communities in the things that we're uh, that we're you know that we face. So uh, as things arise, I will bring them up and um, we'll 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 keep everybody updated. So thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. This is John Kane. This is Let's Talk Native. Yahweh.